Hi everyone, I'm Andy Bailing. I'm the editor of Madison Magazine, and thank you so much for logging on tonight to this virtual kickoff event to Madison Magazine's Restaurant Week. I'm excited and honored to host this conversation amongst local chefs and business owners as they talk about what restaurant reinvention looks like. Thank you to our panelists, who tonight are Joshua Berkson from Lucille Merchant and Cook It Forward, James Bloodsaw of Just Veggies, Patrick O'Halloran of Lombardino's, The Tipsy Cow and The Deliciouser, Brennan Nardi of Harmony Bar and Grill, and also a former editor of Madison Magazine, and Rachel Stanley of Dottie Dumplings Dowry. I'd also like to recognize and thank our sponsor for Restaurant Week, which is Keep Wisconsin Warm Cool Fund, and supporting sponsors, the Wisconsin Beef Council and E&J Gallo Winery. We're delighted to share this event tonight for free and hope that you might consider making a contribution to our charitable partner, which is Cook It Forward. I hope you enjoy the conversation, and if you don't already, I would love for you to subscribe to Madison Magazine or renew your subscription for local insights and stories about people and places in our community. Um, before we jump into the conversation, let's start with a cocktail demonstration. I've actually, I've got my cocktail right here with me, um, but Lucille's Caitlin Nicholson, she's going to show us how to make a pink chimney from Lucille. Cheers. Hi, I'm Sarah. I'm here with Caitlin at Lucille downtown. She is going to make us a pink chimney and hopefully warm us up and give us something to toast for this event. <laughs> Awesome. So first you're going to start with your vodka. If you don't have uh, anything to measure at home, you can just do like a three or four count. Citrus juice, there's lemon and lime. And then we have our syrup, which is a blackberry rosemary reduction. It's got a little bit of Campari in it as well. This one you can do a two count if you don't have that sounds complicated. It is does. there a way to, to make that easier at home? Um, you can boil down and boil down some blackberries with some sugar and rosemary and for about like 10 minutes and you'll get pretty much the same result. Great. So you're going to add your ice lastly before you shake. If you don't have a shaker at home, you can always use like a protein shaker or a mason jar, honestly anything with a tight lid. soda water I always put it in first just so you can kind of measure it out a little bit and you can put it in any glass where you want anything pretty you have at home so pretty if you <laughs> wanted to order that for takeout it's one of your cocktail kits too yep. Correct, you can come pick it up at Lucille. I believe they're about like $41. Great. We can get you all the ingredients in for you. Excellent, thanks cool. so much. <laughs> Thank you. Cheers to our viewers, and uh, they're probably hopefully uh, sipping on pink chimney cocktails or, or a mocktail um, that Lu Lucille's bar manager whipped up for us. Um, and we've got an awesome group here today. Thank you guys. Um, you guys are your chefs, your business owners, your community members, your employers. Um, I'm, I was hoping we could first start out just with a couple um, introductions and, and go around the room. I'll start just clockwise from, from where I am. Uh, Brennan, do you want to introduce yourself? Yes, uh, thanks for including the Harmony Bar and Grill, uh, where I am the owner. Awesome, and Rachel. Hi, I'm Rachel Stanley. I'm the owner of Daddy Dumplings Dowry. And Patrick. Hi, I'm Patrick O'Haller, and I'm the chef partner at Lombardino's Restaurant, as well as the Tipsy Cow Taverns and the newly minted uh, The Delicious Earth Spice Blending Company. <laughs> And James. Hi there. I'm the owner of Just Veggies, and I thank you for having me too. Great. And Josh. Uh, hello. I'm uh, president of Rule Number One Hospitality Group. Uh, I'm co owner of uh, Lucille and Merchant, and uh, co founder of the Cook It Forward uh, nonprofit. Great. And yeah, I'm excited to, to have a forward looking conversation with you guys um, that, that touches on how you, you all have kind of navigated through this and what you see looking ahead. 
Um, and feel free to just interrupt, jump in, take the com conversation wherever you want, want it to go. Um, I'll, I'll be here to pose some questions, but I, I really want you guys all to feel free to um, speak freely and ask each other questions if you'd like. Um, but I think a, a good place to start um, would be to talk about Cook It Forward. Um, which is the beneficiary of this free event. And you can still make a gift online um, at cookitforward.com. And you'll be sure to just select Mat Madison Magazine event from that drop down option um, of how you heard about the organization. Um, and they're encouraging viewers to, to make a donation to that. Um, but Cook It Forward, I think it's a great example of an innovative program that's kind of come out of the restaurant industry right now. Um, it's a collaboration between local restaurants and nonprofits and last mile delivery drivers um, to get meals to food insecure areas. Josh, correct me if I'm wrong. I, um, Josh is one of the co-founders of Cook It Forward. And I'd love to hear from you, um, you know, uh, and hand it over to you to first talk about kind of what sparked that idea and, and where you see it going next. Yeah, I really, really appreciate you bringing Cook It Forward into this conversation and as, as a sponsor for this, this event. Um, really appreciate all the participation that we've had throughout the community and especially um, hope that everyone can come in and, and donate, um, you know, to um, kind of kick off this event. Uh, Cook It Forward was really born out of the pandemic and we're looking for it to be more of a long-term solution in terms of fighting uh, food insecurity here in Madison. Um, you know, before the pandemic, restaurants weren't really part of the solution. We were really kind of on the sidelines as other um, nonprofits and, you know, Second Harvest and grocery stores were really part of the solution. But restaurants, since, since we have food production on site, we weren't really able to get that food into areas of need. Uh, the pandemic pushed us all into mobile. And it really actually broke open, uh, we think a huge opportunity for restaurants to be um, getting food out into areas uh, for people in need. So what we're trying to do uh, and what we've proven over the last uh, six months or so is that we can successfully aggregate meals across uh, restaurants in Madison. Uh, we, we have a refrigerated truck that picks up all of these meals and then we bring them uh, to our nonprofit partners to go ahead and bring them to pantries as well as last mile providers who bring it literally uh, to apartment complexes and to people's doorsteps. Uh, so uh, right now, Cook It Forward is paying everyone along the way to be able to do that. And we're really looking at the entire food system uh, in terms of equity uh, and in terms of not just getting, um, you know, the cheapest meal out there to the person in need, but also playing a role in doing it in a healthy way, uh, doing it in a way that, um, doesn't just go to, to one area, but really tries to get it into the 10 food access areas that have been identified as this city is uh, in the city of Madison as areas that really need food. So we wanna continue to grow it. We wanna bring on more restaurant partners. And as the restaurants get on their feet, uh, we're hoping that restaurants can be contributors or donators of food um, to get even more food out into, into the, the area. Um, as we get on our feet. Right now, we're kind of taking the World Central Kitchen uh, model where we're paying everyone along the way, including restaurants. And we're really looking as, as restaurants to get up on their feet to uh, grow the program and create really an impetus to aggregate tons of meals downtown, package them and get them to, to people in need in a, um, in a really efficient way. So this really uses technology and uh, it uses uh, everything we've learned out of this pandemic to uh, create something really new. What's the impact so far, Josh? So the impact right now is really a proving ground. I mean, we're only doing, um, you know, anywhere from 300 to 1,000 meals a week. And that, you know, it, it is creating, a, um, you know, it's great for the people who are getting these meals. It's really a mental reprieve. Uh, to not have to, you know, plan the next meal and to be able to lean on Cook It Forward to get that meal. Um, but to create real impact, we really need to use technology and get a whole bunch of partners and donating partners uh, to really create um, a really sustainable impact. But we're one part of the solution and we're all in this together. Yeah, and, and you talk about getting restaurants up, you know, back up on their feet for this to kind of take the next step. 
Um, I know we, we in our initial talks, we talk you guys talked a lot about how important it is to just creating that equitable, equitable business model um, for your restaurant. Um, Rachel, can you can you talk about how Dottie's, um, you know, you, you talked about how important it is to own your own building. Is that right? Yeah, um, you know, we're fortunate in that situation. There's a lot of restaurateurs that do not own their building and um, it brings a lot more challenges to, to paying your rent and, and everything else that comes along with that. Um, so I have to say that in a way it's almost our saving grace right now where I can, you know, I know we're gonna get through this. Um, it's not gonna be easy and it's gonna take many years of rebuilding, but um, because we do own our property, that is a, that's a huge benefit to us. And um, I, I'm very grateful for that. I, I'm feeling for my, my brothers and sisters who do not have that uh, privilege right now. Yeah, and, and um, the, we, we talked also about the labor shortage um, and how there was one pre-pandemic and there, there isn't one now, right? In, in the current times? I think there's a little bit of both. Uh, we definitely had one before. Um, right now, you know, I think you're seeing a little bit of, of a shortage. There's certain people that definitely want to come on and work as much as they can. But, you know, a part of our population that was working here before isn't quite ready to come on full board. And maybe it's because of their comfort levels around COVID um, or other reasons. Um, so I wouldn't say it's necessarily easy to hire at the moment. Um, but but we're hoping that when we come out of this, it's, you know, we're gonna be entering what I like to refer to as the roaring 20s again, and that it's gonna be really um, easy and there's gonna be a lot of people ready to get out and, and start their lives again, especially in the workforce. And Patrick, can you talk a little bit about how Lombardino's has navigated this time and, and with your new, new venture? Well, Lombardino's, um, we do have the benefit of owning the building there. The two Tipsy Cow locations, we are tenants. So those were a little bit more challenging. As we had only one year of uh, history in Sun Prairie at our new location, which you know has a lot of debt associated with it. So that one was the, is the one that we're the most worried about and have to get up and running the quickest. Lombardino as we have that benefit of owning the building. So we have a low cost of occupancy there. Um, and that's something I just encourage anyone getting into the industry to think forward, look ahead and try to get those um, uh, buy-sell agreements. Like when we bought the business and 20 years ago, we had a, the first right of refusal to buy our building. And that was the first thing we did, which really set us up for success long-term. Um, so we uh, decided that we would close for a few months. And then when we did reopen, uh, we're still in phase one. We're at 25% indoor occupancy, which we really keep very low. We've had great cooperation from the customers and the guests, but we only brought back a very small staff and we're only open Thursday through Sunday, which are our prime hours. And we're open 4.30 to 8, which are very limited hours. So I have a limited staff and limited hours, but we're maximizing that. Over the summer, the patio was a saving grace for us because we're leaving so much money on the table, doing so much carryout. Restaurants really depend on the bar sales to kind of equalize or, you know, that's where our profit margins really come in. That's the easiest money for us. So um, we're fortunate. We have great support from our neighborhood. And the one saving grace of this is our older clientele isn't coming out and we're finding a whole new younger audience that's coming to the restaurant right now. Yeah, and let's back up though and talk about patios for a second. Brennan, I know you, you've you added um, outdoor areas to Harmony, right? Yes, and I, I would echo um, what Rachel and Patrick have said about you know the benefit of owning your own building and uh, property that has absolutely saved us. And then being able to expand outside, um, turning our parking lot, uh, seven to 10 parking spaces into an outdoor area for folks uh, literally saved the business in June when we decided to reopen after being closed for 46 days. So um, we had um, a, a wonderful relationship with, with Wilmar Neighborhood Center and other community centers around our neighborhood. And um, I approached them about um, 
donating some of their tables and uh, traffic drums and, and things like that to be able to put together an outdoor space. So on the one hand, it was, it was quick, it was, it was cobbled together, it was, you know, something, you know, in the moment, just trying to pivot and respond to what was going on. Um, but the community really came together, um, being able to get the tables, customers brought, um, just donated chairs and you know, we were at Menards all the time buying things, um, you know, bug spray and, and votive candles and tents and, and things like that. But um, it, it really worked. And um, we had always wanted to expand outdoors and, and hadn't yet. And this, this, again, you know, making lemons out of making lemonade out of lemons, it, it really worked out for us. And the plan is to move forward and create a permanent outdoor space. So cool. I, I personally love the, the, extension of the patios. I feel like a, a lot of diners are excited about that. And it's just, it's a, it's a nice way to feel comfortable still, you know, if, if, if people aren't comfortable going inside just yet. Um, and, and Josh, the streetery program, that had to have just been such a, a, a good thing for, for Lucille and Merchant, hasn't it? Yeah, it's really been a lifeline. Um, and, uh, you know, we're just, we're lucky because we have a very wide street and we're, we're allowed to have a 20 foot fire lane uh, that can continue through the street here um, while also getting seating outside. So I'd love to see street areas expanded um, around the Capitol Square, for example. Um, you know, State Street needs to really embrace, um, you know, that type of aesthetic better, um, I think. Um, I think this has really broken up, you know, a new way of thinking about how we dine and how we can use the streetscape better. Um, you know, pre-pandemic, there are very stringent rules regarding leasing of patio space and certain guardrails that need to happen um, or enclosures, they, they, you know, that they, they call them. And, and uh, when you go to other cities, you see, um, you know, a, a, a good variation of, of patio space that's in some ways built into the streetscape. A whole lot more, uh, um, there's just a lot more diversity of patio. Um, and even though we're in a Northern climate here, there's, there's a lot of uh, need and uh, even more technology now to make uh, patio life even more seamless. So um, it's great to see the city embracing new ideas and, and looking at other, other models throughout uh, the country in terms of, uh, you know, really creating that interaction with the street. Um, so I, I really see, uh, I, I see this as a big opportunity. We're gonna have the streetery continue in April and throughout the summer. Um, so kudos to the city for that. And I look forward to conversations in terms of some longer term uh, treatments to the, to the patio across downtown uh, in general. Um, so we can, uh, we can continue on this trend. And, and James, you're, you're in an entirely different situation being a, a catering business. How were you reaching customers pre-COVID and how are you reaching them now, now during COVID? Thanks to Madison, uh, uh, I did um, a lot of vegan fests like all over um, the Midwest, Milwaukee, Chicago, Indiana, um, Michigan, Ohio. And so when COVID hit, they canceled pretty much all the events. So I started doing, I partnered up with a Goodman Center and I started doing pop-ups. So that's pretty much, it was just curbside. Um, they can get different options. Uh, sometimes it just be a one plater and they pull up in the roundabout, we put it in a trunk and they drive off. So that's pretty much what I, been doing since COVID. Yeah, it, it's, and I, I feel like there's a bit, you know, that kind of touches on the topic of ghost kitchens too, um, and how there's a lot of these new concepts that are popping up that it is, you know, very much, lean, you know, to caters to the curbside concept. Um, can you, can you guys talk a little bit about that? I know, didn't uh, Lucille, you guys launched a, um, a chicken, a fried chicken? ghost kitchen concept, is that right? Yeah, we have a number of concepts, um, you know, basically, you know, any brand, I mean, Lucille um, is very, very good with, with takeout uh, in general, but um, Merchant, for example, um, launched a fried chicken concept called uh, Duck Lips. 
Um, and um, it's really taken off. Um, and, you know, Merchant itself didn't really, as an independent, you know, kind of, um, you know, experience-driven restaurant on, on the inside, it didn't really cater to uh, to go offerings quite easily. So um, we invented a new brand um, and used Merchant as a, as a ghost kitchen, if you will. We have excess capacity in our kitchen to be able to um, to be able to curate food uh, to go. Uh, so the new brand enabled us to target even a different demographic, a different audience, um, test new menu items, and really um, create a whole new channel for us. So in the, in the future here, you're going to really have restaurants focusing on on-premise, um, and that comes, all, that comes very easy for a lot of us on this call, and then really focusing on to-go and delivery and virtual uh, virtual brands using ghost kitchens are the wave of the future, and it's a third very important channel. Josh, have you found that to be successful so far, the, the ghost kitchen concept? Yeah, um, we um, right now, um, Duck Lips is, is playing a big role in uplifting merchant, uh, which, you know, at 25% occupancy and a limited streetery, there's only so much you can do. I mean, Merchant's still alive and well, and we're doing some really great stuff over there. Um, but the virtual concept has allowed us to reach uh, a much bigger audience and uh, really meet people where they're at in terms of what they want right now. It's hey, additional but... sales. It's not, it's not replacing, you know, it, it's just additional sales using existing labor, existing kitchen. And um, it's, um, it's definitely here to stay. Virtual right now is is the biggest news in the industry of 2021. Um, there are companies doing virtual expansions at a clip of 40 new restaurants a day. Um, so you don't have to build a kitchen, you don't have to, you know, the, all the barriers to um, everything we know about in this industry are uh, practically removed. Um, and uh, restaurants, especially ones who are just in, you know, stuck in kind of the, um, the on-premise game have found, especially the, the big companies here have found the ROI to be quite, um, you know, it's, it's very telling right now what's going on. I have a local sort of more grassroots um, example of a ghost kitchen here at the Harmony where um, a former restaurant owner in the neighborhood approached me a couple of months ago um, with a concept um, to um, run bagels out of the back uh, kitchen. We have two kitchens here at the Harmony. And so she's been working for the last couple of weeks um, with the public health department, um, getting um, all of the practical um, guidelines in place for her to open her business, the legal, the accounting, everything like that. And she's doing a little mini startup in our back kitchen using our pizza oven, um, making bagels. Um, so she's gonna be launching that here in the next couple of weeks. And it's, for me, it's wonderful to be able to have a space um, for a creative entrepreneur to kind of um, get back into the food business. Um, and she pays rent um, to use the space. So it's extra income and it's just something creative and collaborative and, and fun and interesting to do um, during COVID. So I'm really excited about, about that moving forward and, and perhaps we can keep, keep doing it. That's how the Deliciouser started. We started in the basement of Bunky's Cafe right down the street from you. Um, yeah. Teresa and Rashid being friends and supportive of the whole restaurant community made that space available to us at no charge. So we were able to start our business and now we started in November and we launched and now we're starting to pay them rent. So that's a benefit to them. And they're doing their, you know, their pop-ups with their food, as well as serving uh, a lot of grocery stores with their hummus and their baba ganoush and all of their products. But they've really just reached out and been great supporting us. And so the Deliciouser came out of COVID, you know, after that labor shortage in 2019, 2020, just after 20 years at Lombardino, I was working more and more hours than I've ever worked. Um, I was ready for the break when it hit. Um, and then took some time to breathe and then found I did not like being not busy. So we started a family business of blending spices and cooking at home with a YouTube channel. And that led to conversations. And we started a blended family business out of this. 
Um, and obviously we're not seeing any money from that yet. Uh, in Italy, they say you plant olive trees, not for yourself, but for your children. And that's kind of where the delicious are is right now. But um, like you said, you know, we're able to help bunkies and they were able to help us. And uh, it was great synergy. That's, that's awesome. And I feel like, you know, going back to ghost kitchens and, and the delicious are, you guys are reaching new audiences, you said. Um, and, and James, I, I have a question for you because you're, Just Veggies is vegan and, and plant-based cuisine. Are you seeing your, your audience wanting, or are you, are you seeing people wanting more vegan or plant-based food options since COVID? Yes. Um, a lot of customers uh, told me that uh, they wanted to choose a more healthier option you know, we'll add a healthier option to their diet. So uh, I've been seeing a lot of new customers. Part of me, you know, I feel like the comfort food is totally a thing too, that people want that, you know, the, the um, big kind of hearty meal. Um, but, but, and you, you also, you, you make plant-based food kind of, kind of hearty and, and comfort food too, right? Yes. Yes. I pretty much, uh, make um, um, chicken sandwiches, um, gyro sandwiches, um, barbecue sandwiches, uh, deep fried drumsticks, everything plant-based vegan. That's so cool. How, how have you, how has everyone else seen your, your customer changing or are their, their food preferences changing at all since COVID? I would say the comfort food um, is is has become very apparent at the Harmony Bar. Uh, we're selling more walnut burgers than ever. It was a popular veggie burger before, and we just you know are constantly in the kitchen making more batches. And we also launched a fish fry um, in the last couple of months. We had a um, couple of patrons, a couple um, uh, wonderful customers who. Um, approached me about, you know, what can I do? And I said, you know, you want to help me buy a fryer? Um, I, I need, I'd like to start a fish fry because I know that people are wanting that comfort food and, and folks in the neighborhood have been doing well at the restaurants with fish fries. So we've got a fryer, uh, thanks to these fantastic customers. And um, we've started that part of our business and it's, it's you know, it's nothing fancy, um, simple, but it's, it's working out and just another sort of example of, you um, making lemonade during COVID. Yeah, we've seen a huge uptick in our fish fry business at the Tipsy Cow. And I've noticed other restaurants, even like Harvest and uh, La Toile and other restaurants like that are, you know, doing the fish fry. There, there was a lot of call for that throughout the winter. Yeah, I can relate to that as well. Um, Dottie's is definitely selling a lot of fish fries and we're, you know, clearly a comfort food locale. Um, I would say what's really flying right now are, are the milkshakes, actually. Milkshake? <laughs> Even below zero weather. <laughs> <laughs> Comfort food is, is a, it's key during times like this, that's for sure. Yeah, actually, yeah. I'm, I'm actually doing a fish fry on Friday, a vegan fish fry. Oh, oh. <laughs> how cool. What do you make that out of? Banana blossoms. Oh, that's awesome. You've got to be so creative with with some of those dishes. Um, yes, I, 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 I still got to try uh, the Harmony Bars uh, fish fry too. And I, I saw that on on your social media. You guys have have probably had to become super proficient in in technology through this too. Um, what's that been like? Well, Josh, if, I know if I, my uh, if my phone can. Uh... Here. <laughs> so this oh. is uh, this is the counter at Lucille, and it's you know if you work the counter at Lucille, you you it's like working on Wall Street right now. Um, you've got like you know there's there's a tablet for every single brand for every single third party delivery provider uh, plus our POS. Um, there's new technology that can that can help us aggregate all of the orders coming in from everywhere. Um, 
you know, there's orders coming in on every device right now through a lot of different networks, including our websites and our and apps and stuff like this. So um, the customer is forever changed. Um, they want food immediately. Um, they want food anytime. They want food um, that, that looks really good, um, you know, on these third party exchanges. So there's that. Um, and uh, everything outside of our four walls has been completely wrapped around technology in the last few years, whether we like it or not. Um, and it's making us much more efficient. We measure everything as a, as a group. Um, we talk about the numbers a whole lot. And, and for us, uh, I mean, we do pretty considerable volume uh, at our restaurants and, um, you know, the, the, you know, small errors can turn into um, really big mistakes. So um, we, uh, we've been able to really utilize technology to its fullest to be able to do what we're doing right now. We're actually selling more food now than we were pre-pandemic. Um, really? Our bars are, are have their hands behind their backs and um, and our food program too. I mean, we just we don't have enough enough seats or enough occupancy. But uh, the demand for um, you know the demand for for food uh, and rooted food and comfort food, like we were saying, as well as uh, the demand for food um, through all of the delivery partners. It, it, the, the aggregate is, is bigger than the whole uh, right now. Um, so that's, that's exciting, um, but um, uh, it's, um, you know, we're gonna have to continue to find ways to make that sustainable. I would, I would um, talk about the, the sort of opposite of, of what you're doing, which I have huge respect for, but I, once COVID hit, I, you know, I, I talked to every um, vendor, um, you know, DoorDash, Uber Eats, you know, I went down that, that road with folks and ultimately decided, you know, it's, it's all about a sense of place and where you are and who your customers are. And um, I just had uh, real concerns about um, of people who weren't staff um, at the Harmony, um, you know, delivering food or, or handling food and you know we, the operation for us is so small and the margins are so much smaller um you know we're a local neighborhood bar and grill a tavern a wisconsin tavern so for us i just made the decision that it wasn't worth um the risk really of um allowing anything related to the brand of the harmony to be outsourced um, but the one positive that, that I think came out of this with technology is that we overnight went from a cash business to a non-cash business. We literally um, didn't take credit cards and um, because of COVID and online ordering uh, switched to it. I, I don't love the two and a half percent or more that um, credit card companies charge and you know that gets passed on to the customer now, which is too bad. The walnut burgers cost more. Um, but at the same time, I do think that it is increased business. Our food business is better than ever. And our customer base is, is wider and broader because of technology and social media and online ordering. What's that yeah, I would like echo that. I would echo that our, our kitchen at Lombardino's is producing more food than it ever has. Uh, my cooks are just saying these are some of the busiest shifts they've ever worked because in the restaurant we have 24 tables and they fill up you know, gradually. Um, but now when we open the doors at 4.30, I might have 30 to 50 orders already hanging on my ticket rail. So it's, you know, like it's inequitable. Like Josh said, the, the bar isn't doing anything. The bartender is just there ringing in orders. I've got four people carrying phones around in the dining room, constantly answering phones. And all of the heavy lifting is put on the kitchen right now and in, in our situation. Um, so, and we've coped with it really well. I think it's actually brought our very tight little crew together and we have great teamwork and great spirit around it. Um, and great cooperation. I have to say, since everyone came back, I haven't had one person say they didn't want to wear the mask or that it was a pain. Everyone's just really taken up the sanitation and all of the health code things that we have to follow. And they've come together as a really good team, but it is a different dynamic right now where it's so much food. Um, which has a very low profit margin as opposed to what we normally would do with a full bar. It, it almost has no profit margin um, with the third parties. I mean, they're taking 15 to 30, 30% of the order 
So, you know, while I'm saying we're doing more food now, that's great, but we've had complete services taken away from us. You're right, the bar um, isn't, isn't playing a leading role or, or an equal role like it should, at, at least in our concepts. And, um, and the overall sales are much lower year over year, but the, um, the pressure on the kitchen to churn out quality food and be able to change up your menu to make it more portable um, and, and reach the customer in some way that, 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 you know, represents us and what we do is a real challenge these days. Rachel, you never intended to do takeout at Dottie's. How has this changed your kitchen? Yeah, I mean, we've always done it, but obviously with COVID, we really had to, to make it, make it an increase in that. And, you know, it's been really great. Um, we haven't had any problems so far. I think that um, it's a desired product that, you know, continues to fly out the door at the moment. Um, I do not use third parties. Um, I feel that if you're craving a Dottie's burger, you're, you're, you might make the trek to do it. And so far it's been working out fine. We have made a, a really wonderful um, curbside lane that you can literally just pull up in and then we come out with your food. So you don't even have to get out of your car for any of our orders, which has also been a great benefit. Um, so we, we've been happy with it so far. I think that um, we've definitely pivoted and created a, an area that we never really um, put too much energy into and, and now we're on our way. And I look forward to bringing that into the next phases as we um, regroup and come back together as, as restaurants in the regular restaurant world. And I look forward to, to having somewhat master this part of it and that we can integrate this into our, our everyday uh, lives again. So we'll be good. And, and James, are you, a, do you have a staff or are you a one man band? Um, it's me and my children. <laughs> oh, nice. Family, yeah, family thank operation. You. What, what, does, what does the future look like for you? Are you looking at expanding or changing your business at all? Yes, I'm looking for a, a brick and mortar. I'm looking oh, for a you? local. Somewhere probably on the east side. On the east side. Yeah, you, we, we talked about hyper locality and how important that's been to you guys to really kind of capitalize on, on the people that are around you and, and within walking distance from your, your establishments, right? Yeah, we, at Lombardino's, we've always been supported by our neighborhood, even in, over the years, huge snowstorms, people walk down for dinner, the hospital, the hotel, the UW, we get a lot of the professors and doctors and people from the surrounding neighborhood, and even with installing the patio in our parking lot this past summer, which was great, uh, people want to see that all the time, and they love it, and they even sat out there when the temperature was in the 30s. They pulled the heaters around them, and even over the past weekend, someone said they would sit outside, and it was below zero. So <laughs> it was a ridiculous request, but um, it's nice to know people support us. That's awesome. And is there is there a certain call to action for diners here that you guys are seeing that they could also become a part of the solution in, in moving the, the local food industry forward? I think the most important thing diners could do to support right now is to make sure that we can maintain the streetery program. We can maintain um, any abilities we might have to expand to patios for even some of us that are you know outside of the square area um, and especially State Street. Um, State Street really needs all of our help to rebuild. Um, and I think that we should all be pushing our community to um, allow that to be a more pedestrian, diner friendly um, street. So I think that's what we can do to help the community as far as the restaurants go. That would be a, a big push. I've been um, overwhelmed um, by the support of our community here on the east side, um, our GoFundMe campaign, um, but really the generosity, and I'm gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna tear up, but um, the, the, the generosity of the people who come in and I mean, $20 tips on a $5 beer or, you know, it's just, 
you know, people are incredible right now. And it's, it's really heartwarming to fe really feel the love uh, and support of not just, you know, the harmony, but the staff, because those folks are, you know, everybody's hurting right now. So it's been really wonderful. Sorry. <laughs> oh. Thank you. Yeah, no, and it's, I mean, I feel like this is just totally exposed just how loving and caring this industry yeah. is and how much it means to so many people, you know, what's, what's more comforting and, and show, you know, showing of love than providing a, a, a great plate of food to someone too, so. Um, well, great. We covered a lot of ground here, um, and I, I think we're we're hitting a hitting a certain time. Is there anything else regarding you know what you guys are looking to the future to, would, or what, what you see changing? Yeah, I mean, I, every part of every conversation we have internally right now is about equity and about um, you know how can we really move our industry or to have policies and um, practices that are open to everyone uh, that pays people equitably um, and creates a sustainable workforce to where we really continue having this be a real, a, a great profession. Um, something that we can all take pride in, in terms of not just serving our community um, that we all feel passionate about, but serving each other um, and hiring people with an outlook um, that understands that everyone is, you know, has one life to lead and, you know, we want to do great things and we want to do great things together. And to do that, it can't rest on one person. It can't rest on one department. Um, the COVID has definitely shaken up our departmental silos, um, where we're all in this together. No, no one is better than anyone else. Um, and, you know, managers and owners included. Um, and so every conversation, we talk about racial equity. We talk about trying to bring in people that, um, you know, are going, they have, everyone has challenges and how can we create a more open and inclusive environment? And it's not just lip service. It has to do with actual business practices and putting, um, putting dollars in areas that's gonna create, and that, that means in our staff's pockets that are gonna create more sustainability moving forward. And so I think the next 10 years is not gonna be about creating delicious food and craft cocktails, fine. Uh, lots of people can do that, but as an industry, can we um, move to a better, more sustainable place uh, in terms of equity? That is the mission right now of, um, of our group. So refreshing to hear that, you know, like, like Brennan says, making lemonade out of lemons, but it really just putting a lot of brain power into how can we make this better and what, what makes sense for, for you guys and for your staff members and um, just really, really interesting to hear. So in early March when COVID hit, we had to uh, reorganize our businesses. What we did is we took the downtime while we were closed to imagine the possibilities. And it got us thinking, how can restaurants play a role in the pandemic? I realized quickly that there's a real divide between restaurants and addressing food insecurity. It hit us that there was just this feeling of like helplessness, right? And it was like, how can we do more? Cook It Forward was created in order to provide meals for folks in the community that needed it while still helping our restaurants and keep them uplifted during COVID times. So it's an organization of restaurants that have partnered around Madison, Wisconsin, and a couple other nonprofit organizations that work with us um, to help facilitate getting those meals actually to the people that need them. We collaborated with Alnisa Allgood from Collab for Good, and she really brought to light that we needed to do the reaching out to folks in the community who were already helping their neighbors. We run what internally we call the R Mile Network, and that's basically predominantly black and brown led social ventures that were already providing services to hard to reach communities. A lot of these communities that the meals are going to, um, there's different backgrounds. 
We want to make these meals as approachable as possible for everyone in the community. Right now, our end-to-end -end solution uplifts everyone in the food system. Cook It Forward is, you know, helping all of those restaurants pay for their employees. It's not just producing food for those who are in need. The cool thing about Cook It Forward is that not only are we bringing food to a distribution center, we're making sure that those meals are being taken by last mile delivery drivers into the hands of someone that needs it. We know that it's not just going to be left at a food bank somewhere. I think the biggest thing that's different for them is, is that the meals are prepared. It's a mental reprieve, I think, from all of the stressors. The demand is, is obvious and it's there, and we wish we could meet that demand. The supply is in place. We've onboarded probably a half dozen restaurants thus far, and we've got another dozen waiting in the wings to produce more meals. We serve over 550 meals a week. We hope to increase that number, and we've got a wait list of families that we're excited to add on to our list of folks that we can serve. There is something wrapped in that meal other than food, and that is love and that is hope. If we can inspire those two things, we've done something really, really good. Thank you guys so much for being here. Um, and, and this is part of our Restaurant Week program. Um, so I encourage just the viewers out there, now go order your meals and, and have a good good local meal here. We're hoping that this, you know, Restaurant Week encourages diners to, to get out and support support local restaurants. Um, but thank you guys again. I really appreciate your time um, and, and have, a, have a good rest of your night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.